Hi, everyone. My name's Adrian Warnock, and I'm here with uh, John Stevens. Um, John is the director of the FIEC, and um, that's a UK organisation. Perhaps, John, you could just first of all start off by explaining what what the FIEC is and what you do there, please. Hi, Adrian. It's great to be with you. Yes, the um, FIEC is the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. We've been around since 1922, and it's basically an association of um, evangelical churches um, that want to support and encourage one another. They're churches that are evangelical. They hold to um, a historic evangelical confession of faith. They're united in the core truths of the gospel. Um, we're a family of independent churches, which means we're not a denomination. Those churches are all self-governing, um, but they've chosen to want to be in relationship with one another for mutual um, support. Uh, we're a network of churches that are complementarian in, in our leadership. So our churches would recognize that pastors and elders ought to be uh, male but we would um, also want to value biblical women's um, ministry. Um, we're clear on same-sex relationships and regard the Bible as teaching that sex is only appropriate for heterosexual relationships. So those are our defining criteria. Um, so our churches come from a variety of historic backgrounds. So some would be brethren in origin, some Baptist in origin, some Congregationalist in origin. Some have come out of um, Methodism. We've had some churches that have come out of Anglicanism. But they want to come together as independent churches to stand for the gospel um, together, to be able to work together to try to get the gospel out to more people. Our great vision is to want to see faithful Christ proclaiming churches in every community. Today, we're about 644 churches. So we've grown by about 240 churches in the last 10 years. Um, we are uh, a network that our churches are planting churches. So we're seeing something like about 15 new churches planted per year um, across FIEC. Um, and basically, I lead the central staff team that exists to serve and support those churches. We see our role as um, providing help to leaders and congregations, navigating all the challenges of ministry and, and the culture, and especially to be able to foster relationships between local churches. So it's really all about seeking to um, empower and encourage the work and witness of local churches. OK, so... Um... Would there be how much variety would there be within those churches in terms of some of the other sort of areas that kind of divide us uh, as Christians these days? I mean, like, for example, things like worship style, charismatic, non-charismatic um, size, because some churches are very large, some are very small. Is there anything else that tends to mark your churches out? Or? Yeah, I mean, there's a degree of diversity across the churches. FIC was founded to be diverse. So our boundary is marked by these core gospel truths. Mm. And within that, there's freedom for churches with a wide variety of um, expressions of ministry and views on secondary issues to belong. So we're not an exclusively Baptist organisation. There are churches within FIEC that would be historically Peter Baptist or would be um, dual practice and welcoming both those from a Baptist and Peter Baptist background. Um, our churches would have a variety of different views on issues like, for example, the charismatic movement. So we're not a non-charismatic movement. Most of our churches would probably be um, historically continuationist, but cautious. But there is a spectrum. And um, certainly in the UK at the moment, we have a growing number of churches that have come from a Pentecostal background, particularly those that are from an ethnic minority with the large number of diaspora churches that are beginning to start in uh, the UK. Um, uh, we would have a spectrum of theological views on issues uh, like, for example, reformed theology, uh, like the observance of the, um, the Sabbath, um, uh, how to engage with um, the culture. So uh, we're not a monochrome um, group of, uh, of churches. Um, as with any group of churches, there's a centre of gravity. So there are more churches in some groups um, than in others, but we want all to be welcome. And our vision is to want to bring together um, churches that stand on those core um, gospel convictions. In terms of size, um, there's a diversity of size. We Our largest church is about a thousand people. We've got a number of churches that would be in the range 600 or above, often in city centres, connecting with um, students and younger people. Historically, the heartland of FIEC has probably been in suburban contexts. The um, average FIEC church would be around 150 regular attenders. And then there are a, a, a sort of a good number of smaller churches, mm. um, perhaps in rural areas um, where it's quite difficult to sustain gospel ministry. So there is a significant spectrum um, of size of churches over the last um, 10 to 15 years. Um, actually, we've had an increase in the number of larger churches and medium sized churches. One of the things that's hugely encouraging me at the moment is on the ground, 
many churches are growing after covid we've seen congregations grow more people come in more conversions so particularly um medium-sized churches and larger churches that are in bigger urban contexts are seeing significant growth at the moment and we're really encouraged um, by that again in terms of worship style that's a matter for local churches they will sing a range of different um, material um, so there are some churches that would adopt a more um, liturgical um, uh, e emphasis which would uh, perhaps emphasize kind of historic hymns um, through to those that would be um, uh, at the more contemporary um, end mm. of the, the spectrum who would be predominantly singing sort of modern and contemporary worship songs the reality is most of the churches would be a blended mix of that um, if you want to think about the average FIEC church it's pretty middle of the road um, to use a, a radio analogy most of our churches are sitting somewhere in the kind of the radio two sort of space rather right. than being a, a kind of a narrowly radio one or a trendy radio six or a intellectual radio three they're they're they're, they're, they're wanting to draw together a broad group of people um around uh, a, a central gospel vision yeah and as you said they i know a number of your churches come from different sort of historical backgrounds and um from a family point of view i know for me a number of the um brethren churches which was a huge part of my family uh, not really my well my parents grew up in that uh both of them um and uh, some of them i think have, have sort of subsequently maybe dropped the title brethren and become part of the fiec i'm i'm, I'm right about that aren't i john uh, yeah in many ways the founding churches of fiec came from a brethren background in 1922 the original churches and there were just 18 tended to be mission hall and brethren churches that were concerned about brethrenism at that time becoming too tight um, right. And in many ways, I think the Brethren are a much neglected group in UK evangelicalism. They were really at the forefront of maintaining the gospel in the late 19th century and on into the 20th century. They were a very active um, church planting group um, and I think had a vision for plural leadership um, and a vision of ministry um, uh, that lots of churches have learnt from. And uh, many FIEC churches have come from a Brethren background or have been influenced by brethren church uh, thinking. Uh, then in the 20th century, particularly after the 1950s, um, uh, churches that had been in other denominational groups um, began to leave those groups because they were concerned about theological drift. And so those churches found a home in FIEC as well, and um, which is why we're now today a relatively diverse group of churches. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things um, about that then is, uh, I mean, you. You, you know, you're absolutely right. And I can't um, agree more with this idea that the uh, Brethren churches were quite important. Um, and um, I actually wrote about that quite recently, in fact. Um, and um, my my grandfather was very involved in that and was was one of those counties evangelists um, preachers and uh, went around helping to plant some of those churches and give strength to some of those churches. So it's exciting to realise that whilst you know the name brethren might not be used very much now um but but also they re regained some of the things that you talk about about you know it, a lot of people would argue they were the first people to really say that churches should be led by a team of leaders rather than just one pastor and uh body ministry and uh and and a few other things like that i mean I think that's absolutely right. And, and lots of um, independent evangelical churches and even other churches in denominations now reflect in their ministry practice and their leadership structure things that were first taught by the brethren. Um, and I think the brethren in many ways had this significant influence. And, and at one level, the reason why brethrenism as a movement has declined um, is, is partly because the key things that they stood for have now become normal in, in a wide variety of different kinds of churches. They were unique um, uh, when they evolved in the 19th century, um, but others have recognised that some of those fundamental ideas are in fact more reflective of biblical practice. So um, within FIEC, churches coming out of a historic uh, Baptist background tended to have a model of leadership of a sole pastor plus deacons. But in the 1970s, there was a move towards having plural elderships, much more on the um, brethren uh, uh, model, and that would now be normative for the vast majority of FIEC churches. I think another area where the Brethren had significant influence was the importance of gathering together for the Lord's Supper and making that a central part of the church's life. Um, uh, again, perhaps non-conformist churches in the past would only hold communion on an irregular basis, maybe a small number of times a year, and it was a, a, a sort of seen as a high point of the church's life. 
Whereas the brethren, I think, communicated the idea that this was the normal gathering of the people of God as they came together to remember the Lord's death and resurrection. Um, uh, and again, that has become more normative uh, in uh, churches. And I think that fleet of foot ability to church plant because they didn't require paid ministers, um, uh, again, is something we can learn from. One of the challenges, I think, for reaching the UK with the gospel when we're only about two or three percent um, uh, evangelical believers is that if we're going to get churches planted in all the communities that need it, we simply don't have the financial resources to be paying full-time ministers and staff to be planting churches. And the Brethren yeah. pioneered a model of bivocational ministry, which I think is absolutely essential if church planting is to explode, to be able to meet the need uh, on the ground. So um, in many uh, churches and, and denominational contexts, church planting is significantly limited by the ability to raise up paid workers and provide the resources. Um, I think the brethrenism, brethrenism showed that that isn't essential to the planting of churches and the getting out of the gospel. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. That's really, really good. So I'll put a link to my article about brethren um, below this for people to have a look at that. But um, I think there's a whole general point about that, isn't it? That there is often these movements of God in restoring to the church things that were lost you know and obviously most people think about the reformation in that and of course that was a huge part of that but 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 when you look back at the reformation from our standpoint often people will look at the things that that weren't um rediscovered at that point um but obviously you know we can have a blind spot can't we to to all sorts of things and we just need god to restore these things um through illuminating the scriptures usually um, and actually allowing uh, churches initially often these movements are rejected I mean of course the Reformation many of them were killed and burnt at the stake uh, but even the Roman Catholics say now that they want to believe some of the things that the Reformation believed and so there is that sort of spreading that goes on with these various movements and that's the way I see church history I don't know if you think that's a, a fair some way of looking at it I think so. I, mean, I, I would draw a distinction between in every generation there are movements and there's mainstream, and it seems right. that it raises up movements in each generation that identify things that the church is missing. They become correctives to the church. They might be critical of um, the church. They're often operating outside of the church, and they set up new churches. They set up new gatherings of, of ministers, um, and that often helps the mainstream churches to recognise things that they have been missing. Very often what happens is the things that are identified by the movement are then ultimately incorporated into the mainstream churches, which change. Sometimes the movements begin um, more extreme and they become moderated over time. The mainstream churches absorb those insights from the movements. And very often the mainstream churches, I think, fail to acknowledge that it's the movements that have influenced them and have shaped um, their ways of doing things. And there's this, um, I, I think, helpful synergy between um, the movements where God perhaps reminds his church more generally of things that it's missed, but how that moves into stability um, in, in a way that endures um, uh, through the generations. Movements very often are um, one or two generational phenomena. They're very difficult to sustain into the longer term. So it's the, the feeding from movement to mainstream that uh, en enables the church to persist and continue from generation to generation. Yeah, and I and I guess you know in in our lifetime, yours and mine, um, one of the main sort of movements like that has, has been the charismatic movement, and a lot of even people, churches that wouldn't say, you know, that they'd be influenced by the charismatic movement actually have been, haven't they? Oh, absolutely, and I think it's more complicated than that because I I think that the charismatic movement was partly a discovery of some particular gifts. It was also an emphasis on a more experiential um, model of Christianity. And I think in the late nineteenth century, twentieth century, there was a tendency to move towards a more rationalistic form of Christianity that was bound up against the reaction against liberalism. Um, uh, uh, and I think there was a fear of emotion and subjectivity. So actually, some of our evangelical forebears. Um, we're, we're, we're much more open to God working in, 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 in particular unexpected ways. But I think in the late 19th century and 20th century, there had become great suspicion uh, of that. So the charismatic movement um, building really in some ways on cultural changes that happened in the 1960s, both led to um, a recovery of uh, ways that God might work by his Holy Spirit, but actually an emphasis on um, uh, the subjective personal experience mm. of God, that, it, that it's not just doctrine. Uh, and I think that theologically, 
part of what was going on there is a recognition that the case for cessationism that uh, that that dominated across Protestantism and evangelicalism just simply wasn't particularly biblically founded. So um, the idea that Romans 13, that uh, prophecy was going to cease, tongues were going to cease, and that this was the closing of the canon and the end of the apostolic age, um, I think careful examination of those texts suggests that that is speaking about the end of um, this current age. They're, they're mm. eschatological rather than connected with the apostolic period. So I think the charismatic movement also prompted a significant rethinking of um, the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit might work today. Uh, and certainly within my more conservative evangelical context, theologians like Jim Packer, John Piper, Don Carson, I think helped conservatives to think about the charismatic movement differently. Um, at the same time, as I was talking about movements, I think there were some radical elements to the charismatic movement that, again, have come to be refined. And those that have come from a charismatic perspective have perhaps begun to take more seriously some of the teaching in the New Testament about the need to test everything mm. and about the way that gifts ought to be used um, in the life of the church in an ordered way to be edifying and building up the body. So. Uh, again, I think both sides have learnt from each other, and that leads to a more mature synthesis. Yes, that's right. And, and I guess this is where movements like FIEC, and also, I mean, we perhaps ought to talk a bit about affinity, because I know you're involved with that as well, and what that is. Um, but also just local connections between churches in a town that may not have some kind of official organisation, but pastors helping pastors, churches learning from each other. I think, you know, there's a large degree of, of safety that comes in that. And I, I know one of the things I did want us to just touch on was this whole idea of of leadership and how churches keep safe, both doctrinally, but also in terms of, you know, um, leadership style and such like. Because, you know, you've talked about movements and, and church planting and new churches springing up. All too often, I think, we're looking actually for a certain type of person to do that. They're very you know, charismatic, not necessarily in the sense of the Holy Spirit, but just in terms of, you know, having a strong personality, maybe entrepreneurial, people want to follow them. There's a high degree of ten tendency within Christian circles of all types, I think, to put people on a pedestal, um, whether that's just in your little local church on a pedestal or whether that's on a national or international pedestal of, of you know, this is a great leader. And sadly, without perhaps getting into details of some of this, we're seeing a lot of these people fall, whether that through be through moral failure or more specifically, um, through failure that, in a sense, comes from the very strengths of those people, of, of their, you know, strong desire to to do these things for God and be, you know, be strong and, and get people working in the mission. And and sometimes that can lead to to perhaps, um, well, what some people even call spiritual abuse, but certainly can be, you know, um, overly controlling, overly scary, overly... I mean, even going back many years, it was the heavy shepherding movement, for example, as well, wasn't there? So I just wonder if you've got any thoughts about how, you know, relating together churches can actually protect um, from some of these things. I think you're absolutely right. And there have been a series of um, uh, revelations of uh, sort of both uh, appalling abuse on the part of some leaders and in some cases, very unwise um, leadership that is um, uh, overly controlling what Jesus might describe as lording it over others rather than serving others. I do think that relating to one another at a local level is a way of helping leaders to keep um, humbled and grounded. Um, I think uh, despite all of those problems, we shouldn't forget that the vast majority of local church leaders are not abusive. Most of them are unknown, humble servants who are getting on with the task and work of caring for God's people and proclaiming the gospel to their communities. So uh, uh, although there have been high profile failures, I don't think we should lose sight of the faithfulness of the vast majority of um, local church leaders that, that nobody has ever heard of. And um, they are getting on, getting on with the job. And I, I, I rejoice in that. Um, but I think you're right. I think that so much of it is to do with evangelicalism, our desire to achieve success. And that's particularly prevalent, I think, in a context in which the church has, has declined, in which there's a, a sort of a real sense of the need to recapture the culture, to reform the church. Uh, and that tends to put a premium on um, sort of Christians giving their loyalty to those who appear to be able to um, deliver uh, success. Um, and very often that requires people who are pioneering, uh, people who are entrepreneurial, people who are able to get things done. And sometimes we can value getting things done, um, even if that is at the expense of the way that people are treated to achieve it. 
Um, and I think the sadness there is that we can easily prioritise um, success and achievement over character and reflecting the, the Lord Jesus. And um, therefore, leaders tend to become high profile who achieve that sort of level of success. Um, uh, so I, I think we just need to go back to the Bible. Uh, we need to go back to what Jesus says about leadership. We need to go back to what are the character qualities required for leadership. Um, we need to be willing to allow the church to grow at God's speed in God's way um, and not to be uh, so driven by a desire to achieve um, uh, sort of measures of success. I think Francis Schaeffer is very helpful there in reminding us that we've got to do the Lord's work in the Lord's way. Um, and trust him that his purposes will be uh, uh, accomplished. But yes, keeping one another accountable, uh, keeping one another aware of um, reality is a hugely important way of guarding ourselves against those dangers. Mm. And, you know, we talked about servant leadership, didn't we, um, when we were sort of setting this up? And uh, it was a funny sort of way that, in a way, this this started to this whole interview came about was it was really through me reading um something you'd written about our uk election and then republishing it on my site um and um how you know something that had been said can speak into this kind of leadership pro process yes that's right i mean i was quite struck by keir starmer's first speech as prime minister in which um he said that his purpose of his government was to serve um, the people, uh, and that was very noticeable. Um, that, that was the tone that he took. Again, I was struck by the contrast with that with um, the Labour victories um, uh, sort of in the past. I think it was back in 1945, where after Churchill was defeated, some of the Labour supporters declared, we are the masters now. And how different it is for someone to say, we are the servants um, uh, now. And I think that reflects um, uh, very much a, a Christian understanding of what leadership is all about. And of course, that's nothing new in the secular world. Within management, people have spoken about servant leadership for decades. And in some ways, they've been learning the very principles that Jesus was um, teaching. So I thought it was quite striking that Sir Keir Starmer, who's an atheist, was speaking um, in terms that Christians would recognise uh, and that reflect Jesus' uh, teaching um, about uh, leadership. Uh, and that is the, the fundamental principle that Jesus sets out for his um, disciples. He's come not to be served, but to serve. It's not about um, uh, gaining a claim. It's not about gaining status. It's not about gaining privilege. It's not about achieving um, what you want for yourself or your small group. It is about genuinely seeking the best good of um, others and being willing to sacrifice yourself um, uh, for them. Now, of course, Jesus is the one who shows us how to do that in his death on the cross. And he is the one who, by his spirit, empowers and enables us to lead in that way. I think the challenge for Keir Starmer and any secular leader is without that spiritual model and without that work of Christ in them, it's very difficult humanly to maintain um, servant leadership. But that is what Christian leaders ought to be um, uh, aspiring to. It's what we ought to be praying for. It's what we ought to be looking for in, in the leaders that we um, appoint. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I do think that um, Christians, though, often almost don't care enough about politics or care too much about politics. I don't know if you'd agree with that assessment. I think that's right. And I think that the confusion for Christians is how they see the mission of God working out in the world. So it, it seems to me there are two opposite dangers. One is to think that the mission of God and building the kingdom is primarily accomplished through political means. I think that flows from an understanding of the kingdom of God as being a transformed society, um, a, a greater external righteousness and morality uh, within a country as a whole. Um, and I think if that is your view of what the kingdom of God is, then, of course, politics will seem a very significant means of achieving that. And the other is a pietistic approach, which says the kingdom of God comes exclusively through the church. The church is only really to be concerned about evangelism. Um, and, and therefore, politics is part of um, a corrupt world. And as Christians, we shouldn't engage with it. I think actually neither of those reflects the biblical um, sort of pattern. It seems to me that um, biblically, um, the kingdom of God does come through the church and the preaching of the gospel, but it has an impact in the wider world. We are to be citizens uh, of the world as well. God has a purpose for government in restraining evil, in doing good. Um, and we ought to, in as far as we are able to, um, uh, uh, support and promote that. Um, uh, in a democratic context in particular, we have 
um, the option of um, choosing um, uh, who uh, rules and governs. We have the option to lobby, to campaign, to protest, to write, to express our opinion, to engage. Uh, again, in many autocratic regimes and in the ancient world, that wasn't available in quite the same way. So I, I think we have a responsibility as citizens to avail ourselves of the opportunities that we have to seek to do good within wider society, to commend Christ, but without expecting that that is the means by which the kingdom of God is brought about. Mm. I, I like that. I like that sort of sense of balance you have there. And of course, that does also have an influence on, you know, the political views of, of Christians as well, because I think... Um, Often, certainly, uh, even in this country, but especially in the US, Christians are perceived as being, de by default, very right-wing um, and, and, and can even sort of trumpet certain types of leaders who, perhaps going back to what we were talking about, might be very strong, uh, might be seen as, as being very charismatic and, and fighting, you know, for, for certain causes that perhaps Christians might mean in many cases might believe in and yet somehow the character isn't quite there of this servant leadership of jesus and and it worries me a little bit that both in churches and in um the world we've been looking for leaders who are perhaps not really like this 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 servant nature that jesus is talking about i think that's right. i think there are a couple of issues bound up there i i, I do think it's difficult for christians engaging with politics because i'm not sure that certainly in a british context any of the political parties represents a holistic Christian vision yeah. or something approximating to it. So I've been reading through the book of Leviticus recently, and I've been so struck by the fact that the book of Leviticus is both concerned about personal sin, sinning, sexual morality, those kinds of issues. It also has a massive concern for care for the poor and the vulnerable, for equality in society, for protection of those who are poor against economic exploitation. Um, so you're not allowed to profit from um, uh, the poor. And I think a biblical vision holds together both of those things. There is both a concern for a, a justice and an equality between people. There is also a concern for individual personal morality. And the way politics has developed in the West is those two things tend to be separated. So there tends to be a yeah. difference between social conservatism and economic conservatism. So um, in Britain in particular, um, Christians, the evangelical body as a whole is actually slightly left of centre. So the recent Evangelical Alliance um, survey would have suggested that a majority of evangelicals would have voted for Labour in this um, particular uh, election, motivated um, uh, sort of by issues of social justice concern and the problems of poverty and inequality within um, society. So a majority of evangelicals in the UK have made the option that the least worst government, as it were, is going to be the Labour government, and those are their priorities. And maybe they think that on the social um, uh, sort of um, areas of, of individual morality, there's not a great deal to choose between the political parties. Yes. Smaller number have um, supported the Conservative Party. I think there is often a very vocal support um, uh, uh, for particularly individual moral issues, which are not unimportant. Abortion, euthanasia, mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of freedom of religion, issue of women's rights and protecting women's spaces. I think those are all incredibly significant issues. And it, it's right to be concerned about them and bring them to the attention of um, our government. I've written to Keir Starmer and my MP raising my concerns about some of those um, uh, sort of issues and how those might um, develop. Um, but 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 I think there's a, a recognition that no party, um, in a sense, prevent holds those things holistically together. So one of the interesting changes in the UK is how liberal progressive the Conservative Party has become over the last 40 years um, mm. on those issues, um, which I think makes the choice for Christians more difficult. And of course, there's a reality that there are evangelical Christian politicians in all parties. So um, uh, there are evangelicals like Danny Kruger, like Tim Farron, like Stephen Timms, who are part of um, the different political parties. So committed evangelicals feel that they can support and work in um, the different parties that are available to us. So I think the UK is slightly different. UK evangelicalism and Christianity has, I think, a much stronger concern for the achievement of um, uh, sort of economic equality, the um, overcoming of um, uh, inequality and disadvantage in society, and believes that government has a role to play in that. Um, and that's been a long tradition in the UK. I think it's quite different in the States, 
where the mm. evangelical vote is um, very much more conservative, both socially but also economically. I think for all sorts of historic reasons, the American um, uh, sort of dream, the idea of uh, kind of economic liberalism, um, individualism, um, the ability to be able to um, succeed yourself, um, that is a very different culture to that that we've experienced in the UK, which I think explains why a much larger number of American evangelicals are attracted to the Republican Party, both because not necessarily it's social conservatism, but also because of the economic position um, that it holds. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and and I think I think there's also um, a lack of understanding sometimes of the need for a safety net. You know, I mean, issues like health is, is I mean, obviously that's a very personal thing for me because you know, the NHS has saved my life, you know, and I, I noticed online that, yes, there are some um, American centres of excellence for, for health, uh, but but those require you to have good insurance, maybe to be in one of the cities. But when I speak to people online in, in some of the little, the, the smaller places, especially, or people who haven't been able to afford insurance, I mean, you hear all sorts of horror stories about people, you know, not getting the treatment that they need, um and 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 literally dying because they don't have enough money which is something that hopefully wouldn't happen in the in the uk or at least hasn't historically happened although you know the nhs is in a bit of a mess right now it, it does feel that that's better than the alternatives personally i mean i think it's it's, it's complicated in in the sense that i think in america you have actually the highest level of health care is available and it but it's not necessarily available to all for the very reasons mm. that you say one of the challenges we have in the UK is that the NHS model, as it works at the at the moment, um, it, it can deliver that care. I have a friend who's undergoing treatment for cancer who is receiving care that in America their insurance company wouldn't cover, but the NHS is spending a fortune. Um, and, and that, I think, is a great blessing. At the same time, because of the way the NHS works, there are lots of people on waiting lists who may not be getting treatment. There are those who will die without getting treatment because of um, the way that the, the system works. So I, I wouldn't want to say that the NHS and the US are, um, in a sense, ours is ideal and theirs is yeah. pro problematic. And I think that um, Wes Streeting, the current health secretary, is obviously looking at questions of how the NHS needs to be changed. And there's a multiplicity of different models as to how to deliver health care. So the model in France um, operates slightly differently, but seems to deliver uh, overall better results. The same is true of Australia. Uh, and I think there's um, a challenge of if the fundamental objective is healthcare free at the point of use, how you deliver that and how you manage that can be done in slightly different ways. Mm. I think our fundamental commitment to provide care for everybody, um, irrespective of their means, is a good and a right one. Whether the NHS quite operates in the way that does that with its mix of private, public, insurance, not insurance, I think is a is a matter for debate. But yeah. that fundamental commitment that everybody ought to have access to treatment irrespective of means um, is, uh, I think, a particular characteristic of um, Britain and social democracies. Uh, I, in America, um, th there might be a safety net, but there isn't quite that same commitment to providing health care for absolutely everybody at the same level. Yeah, I think you're right. The other thing, of course, about the NHS is is about leadership. And, and it is interesting to see what's being said already by Wes Streeting. You just mentioned him. Um, and, and and that is that, you know, he, on day one, he declared that the NHS was broken, um, which is something that has not typically been done. You know, and, and he said it's the, now the official depart, you know, policy of their department that the NHS is broken and needs to be fixed, which is quite interesting because certainly, for example, during the pandemic, um, I personally found as I was trying to sort of battle for some things for some of the um, people like myself who are immune compromised and were struggling uh, to get certain things out of the NHS was there was a kind of arrogance about the reactions where they couldn't possibly have made any mistakes. Um, and um, unfortunately, there's a growing kind of scandal that I think because of the election has been lost a little bit around, which is very similar to what's gone on in the post office, unfortunately, around people who are whistleblowers saying there are problems, that there's been issues uh, needing to be resolved, actually finding that the management, um, as it has at the moment, has, has actually, you know, victimised them and, and investigated them and even fired them in some cases. And I think we're going to be hearing an awful lot more about that. And it seems like we're treating is, is, is kind of quite, determined to change the culture i don't know if you saw after his, his recent meeting with the doctors around trying to say, solve the strike issues 
he said that one thing that he's angry about, he said, is the way that the NHS treats them. And certainly I know people who work in the NHS who say it's actually one of the worst employers in the country, which isn't right. And it, But that comes from leadership right from the top down, I think. I think you're right. So actually, interestingly, I think there are two lessons for Christian leaders in that. Um, it, I think in the British political system, it is easier for the Labour Party to reform the NHS than it is for the Conservative mm -hmm. Party. The Conservative Party has a reputation for being opposed to the NHS, and that makes it politically toxic to consider significant changes. So um, in the same way that, for example, it's easier for the Conservative Party to reform um, defence or cut defence spending or, or, or whatever, because that's seen as, as its kind of area of expertise and concern. In a strange way, it's actually easier for the Labour Party to be more radical in dealing with the NHS. Tony Blair, to some extent, did that in 1997, whereas for the Conservatives, they are simply attacked and accused of privatising. So I think that the fact that Wes Streeting says it needs to be addressed is a good sign. And he probably has the political ability to be able to do that in a way that previous Conservative health secretaries didn't. The lesson for us as Christian leaders is in church life, there are often problems that are untouchable in church life, maybe because of who we are, because of our convictions. Um, actually, we're not, we don't feel that we've got the political capital to tackle known problems because of how people will respond. Real leadership is the willingness to be able to grapple with um, uh, known problems uh, that that are there and to seek to uh, to put them right. So I, I think you're right. There is a, a, a real um, desire to um, sort of put things right and, and name reality and deal with it. Um, uh, I think the other issue you raise is also absolutely right, that um, often institutions and organisations have a culture of wanting to suppress the truth of the reality as what has, ha what has happened. Um, to hide, to cover up, to self-justify. We've seen that with the post office. We saw that with the infected blood scandal. There's another scandal unfolding at the moment in the defence um, uh, arena about people who've developed cancer because of exhaust jets from helicopters. Significant number of pilots and crews have been diagnosed with cancer. There's just the beginning of potential admission that that is because there was a failure to um, protect them. Um, again, doctors who whistle blow um, find that their careers are, are, are affected. And it's all about defending the image of the institution. And again, we have seen that sadly in churches, that where pastors have failed, where there's been bad practice, where people have known about it, often the first instinct has been to cover up and protect the reputation of the institution, rather than to listen to the whistleblowers and consider carefully whether or not what they're raising is real and uh, requires remedial action. So as, as Christians, again, I think we need in our churches and organisations to be able to listen to those who are raising um, concerns, identifying abuse, to properly investigate that and then to take the action that is needed. I think one of the good things that's come out of some of the leadership abuse scandals is more churches, more organisations have put in place proper complaints procedures, proper whistleblowing processes that at least mean that um, uh, there is an opportunity for people to raise those concerns. Um, and organisations are aware now of the reputational damage of doing nothing um, and are more willing to act. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think there's a fundamental thing about identification of leadership and authority almost as an other and separate from the people you're following. That's one of the things that's been a bit of a problem. I, I remember even for me as a doctor, I had when I worked as a doctor, I had this funny mentality that I wouldn't get sick. And I've had a lot of this since I've become a patient. I've been very, very um, involved with, you know, hospital stays and, you know, being taken to and from hospital by hospital transport, having chemo, all the rest of it. Um, and it, it's amazing how many people have said, oh, you know, because my notes call me doctor still, you know, because that's my title. Um, and... Um, and they were like, oh, we thought we were picking up a doctor for their clinic. We didn't realise that doctors could be sick too. Uh, and it, it really made me think, because I think sometimes, you know, that is part of the problem. You have a kind of class of people who consider themselves superior, who are helping those people down there who are suffering without really understanding perhaps the compassion and, and the understanding that we're all, we're all in this together and that actually we're all broken, we're all in need, we're all... You know, and we can all need, and and I guess again, going back to Wes Treating, the interesting thing about him is he 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 actually had cancer as well, and he was a cancer survivor. So I guess he's experienced what 
you know, what the NHS can do at its best. And he was very fortunate to not have to wait on a long waiting list, to have had that cancer diagnosed very quickly and very early and to get the treatment he needed. And so, you know, maybe that's one of the things that, that will help him, hopefully. Well, let's pray for him that it does um, as he comes to try and tackle some of these cultural issues. So, look, you know, it's not us for them. It's not um, this group up here and this group down there and let's all be very professional and 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 not have compassion for those who... Who, who really are in need, because the truth is any of us could need the NHS in one moment tomorrow. I think that's absolutely right. And again, for Christian leaders, it's important that we remember we are, first of all, sheep, not shepherds. Jesus is the, is the chief shepherd. We are the under shepherds. But primarily, we are sheep like everybody else. And I think a sharp division between leadership and God's people is massively unhelpful and ultimately corrupting. To some extent, that is seen in the division between clergy and laity that emerged in the Catholic mm. Church and to some extent continued um, uh, after the Reformation, even though the sacramental element was removed, that sense of a special cast of pastors and elders who were different and distinct. Um, I think that happens with um, concepts of anointed and apostolic leadership. Some individuals mm. are seen as being set apart by God and therefore untouchable and unaccountable. Um, and in many ways, it's back to what we were speaking about, about the brethren. The brethren recognised um, that, 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 that there isn't this, this sharp distinction between clergy and laity, yeah. that, 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 that those who lead are simply those within the ordinary body of the people of Christ that have been gifted um, uh, for their task. And it's a responsibility that they carry. It doesn't make them special. It doesn't make them um, different. But I think we also have to recognise that very often it is actually the church, it's God's people, the congregation who want this anointed leader. So there are some leaders who aspire to that position because it brings them power, privilege and prestige. They want to be better and superior. And I think the Bible warns us against appointing those kinds of people to position. But at yeah. the same time, very often congregations want a superhero. They want someone who will be superior to them because they think that that is what will enable the work to be done they want to look up to somebody in effect they're wanting their their leader to be jesus to them rather than uh, coming to jesus uh, himself so i think sometimes it's ironically congregations that can create the problem it's not necessarily the leader puts themselves on a pedestal but the congregation desperately wants the leader to be um, on a, a pedestal um, and again, I, I think here the example is Jesus. You were talking about doctors experiencing sickness. I was, happened to be reading um, uh, Hebrews um, uh, sort of yesterday, um, uh, which speaks about Jesus, the great high priest. One of the things that's so striking is the way the author of Hebrews speaks about Jesus being um, the one who became fully human, became weak like ours, was tempted in every way as we we are. And the result of that is he is able to sympathize with those who are struggling and those mm -hmm. who are being tempted. Jesus' humanity, his willingness to step into our experience, to live a real human life, is hugely important in terms of his approachability, but it's also his humility uh, in action. He knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to grieve. He knows what it is to love. Uh, he knows what it is to be beaten. He knows what it is to die. Um, uh, all of those are crucially significant for Jesus' um, leadership. And I think there's a real lesson there for us as, as Christian leaders. I think we can sometimes as, even, as conservative evangelicals be a bit suspicious of the idea of incarnational ministry. But there is a mm. very real sense in which being um, genuinely alongside people and sharing their experience um, is exactly the way that we avoid that sense of setting ourselves on a pedestal as if we are different and exempt from ordinary human weaknesses and exempt then from um, ordinary human suffering and ordinary human life. No, I think you're right. And I think one of the challenges there is that we have like this idea that our leaders should be living the sort of the blessed life, you know, that come to Jesus and all your problems disappear. And so surely that means if we have a leader, then then they don't have problems and and they, they sort of rise above and glide through life on some sort of. And it, it's an interesting thing, because even in churches which wouldn't teach um, the prosperity doctrine and, and all of that explicitly there is often this expectation that god will look after us and that god will bless our lives and that we especially if we're serving him 
you know, we won't experience brokenness and pain in our lives, that we'll somehow be immune from the temptation to sin, that we won't really need to sort of say to somebody, hey, I'm I'm struggling in this area, can you help me? Because I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to fall. You know, I mean, a lot of pastors, if they, they, I think they feel if they were to say that to anyone, you know, that that would be it, they'd be fired. And, and even actually things like um, just ordinary human frailty, you know, somehow we don't expect them to get sick. We don't expect them, you know, to have to take a day off, you know, because, I don't know, something's something's gone wrong or or, or, or to just... I mean, it, it's really interesting when you look back to people like Spurgeon from previous generations. He took months off sometimes because of struggling with physical pain and also emotional pain from depression. Uh, and I don't think many pastors would be able to do that today and survive with their jobs. So it, it does worry me that that we're, we're creating this class of sort of superhumans and then, and then, looking for any opportunity to break, pull them down. It's, it's not good. I think that's right, and I, I, I think highlight a number of, of problems there. I think that there is this assumption that that the the mature Christian life is going to be blessed in 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 every area, and um, that's nothing new. If you go back to the nineteenth century, um, with the growth of particularly nonconformity, people were building bigger church buildings because they thought that was a sign of God's blessing. The pastor yeah. often had the biggest house in the community um, and lived at a level above their churches. Wanted their pastors to have this kind of status. Um, and significance. You see that in some church contexts where, again, the pastor has to have the, the, the Rolls Royce or the BMW or the Mercedes, because that's a sign that they're successful and they're God's man ministering um, in, in that situation. Again, Christians can often create that um, uh, sort of expectation. It's ironic that Paul boasted not in all that he had, but in his sufferings and what he endured. So, you know, two Corinthians, his signs of a faithful ministry are the numbers of times he was beaten, shipwrecked, starving. He could talk in Philippians about times when he was kind of well supplied and times when he had nothing. Um, so that that material success and health, I mean, he, he's talking about his thorn in the side, which the Lord didn't take away. I think there's a real danger in a prosperity gospel that suggests that tangible, physical, material blessing is the sign of um, faithfulness to God and is the sign of be, be, being God's leader. Um, but that other issue, I think you're also absolutely right on, is how hard it is for leaders to be vulnerable with others. Um, and to um, seek their support, their help, and and to be honest, um, I, I think leaders find that incredibly hard to share their struggles, their difficulties. Um, they feel that they have to match up to the congregation's expectations, that they are somehow letting people down. They feel that vulnerability. If people really knew what I was like and how I'm struggling and challenges that I'm facing, would they really want me um, to mm. be um, their leader. And I, I think that's probably because we have a lack of honesty and reality about the Christian life, both as church members and as um, leaders. We want to project this um, image of success, happiness, um, everything um, being uh, kind of easy. I mean, one of those things that kind of gets, gets my goat is uh, pastors so often, you know, their picture is them, their beautiful wife, how lovely their family, how lovely their marriage is. And everything. So you kind of think, Actually, the reality is for all of us, these things are of struggles and have, have difficulties, but mm. we project this image of perfection, which we kind of think the world wants to see and often our people want to see. And mm. we, we, do need, we do need to get over that. One of the really interesting things in the Bible about the disciples in particular is how honest it is about their failings. Yes. That they are publicly acknowledged um, uh, 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 and they are um, very, very real um, so you see a, a humanness to the failings of Peter, James, John, um, uh, 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 and others. Uh, maybe a dimension of this that's significant is, is I do think we live in a culture and in a church where although we believe in grace, we don't practice grace. Um, well, yeah, we are, that's we're, not, we're, we're not forgiving. Um, so when people fail, we find it almost impossible to recognize that they have repented, that they have learned and to let go. And where we have a graceless culture in which there is no real forgiveness, in which sin is in some ways treated as more serious and more enduring than the way God treats it, then, of course, we have a culture in which we're not able to be honest with one another. So I think it, it's mutual. We, we, we don't really believe in grace. We don't practice grace. Therefore, we don't have communities of grace. Therefore, we basically present an external image uh, and that ultimately was what the Pharisees did. Um, and I think that ought to be a, a warning to us. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, th there's this idea in the Pharisees, isn't it, what Jesus says about you put a burden onto people and then don't even help them to carry it. 
And, and I, I think, you know, this burden that many pastors feel, and it might be that there's one or two pastors watching this right now who are at the point of tears and, and feeling that, you know, they're vulnerable, they're weak, they're not coping. Maybe the church isn't growing, or maybe it is growing and it's growing too much. And secretly they wish there were less people coming because it'd be less work for them, you know? Um, and they could be in a right old mess, maybe having struggles, maybe they're feeling sick, maybe anything can be going on in their lives. And yet they feel that if they open up about being vulnerable if they let people see that they're weak if they if they if they don't i mean there's this whole thing about responding to adversity in the right way as a christian sometimes as well that you know we, we often say well look at that they're handling it so well uh, and i remember for me there were times when i was sick and some of the other challenges i faced recently but i wasn't handling it well uh, and and that and and i had to get to the point of, of well it's okay not to handle it well actually for a while you know sometimes it's the dark night of the soul there's sometimes God feels very distant. Sometimes we feel angry with God. Sometimes we're, you know, our prayers are, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why is, I remember even saying to God at one point, you know, God, I wouldn't let my son go through what I'm going through right now. Why are you letting me go through this? And, you know, these kind of honest conversations with God even, let alone with each other, are often the the, the exception rather than the rule, I fear. I think that's right. And I think for pastors and leaders, again, it's really important that we distinguish out there are some sins that are disqualifying for ministry um, and we need to recognise that. But that is not true of necessarily all sin or all failing. So um, all of us are sinners. We all sin in multiple ways. Not all sin is disqualifying. So there's a category of sin that is disqualifying because it reveals that you don't have the character that's appropriate for ministry. Then there are areas in which basically we lack wisdom and experience and maturity and we might have messed up and we might have failed. But that's something from which we should learn and seek to get better. And that's where we need a measure of forgiveness and a recognition on the part of the community that we're not perfect, that we are works in progress. And I think pastors feel that their failings will be put into that category. That there's a there's a third issue, which is um, really just simply human weakness that we experience, which is which is part and parcel of the human condition, um, our physical state, our emotional state, our mental state, our capacity. Those change over life. They change with the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So I think it's really important for pastors to see and churches to see that those are those are different things that need to be regarded in different ways. And I think we're often not very sophisticated in, in, in doing that. Um, and again, biblically, we tend to think what we need is the strong man to lead. And that's exactly what the Corinthians wanted. They wanted people who were uh, externally impressive. They thought that that's what was good for the church. Actually, Paul says, um, actually, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong because that's yeah. the grace of God is at work in we. And what we need are sort of people who are real, who recognize their weakness, but in that weakness experience the, the strength and the grace of the Lord Jesus and testify to it. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I, I think that's the thing. If you're struggling as you're listing this and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm in danger of failing as a leader or just failing as a Christian, actually, that can be the point where God can meet you the most. And there's a verse that I've clung on to a lot. And uh, funnily enough, I wrote about this verse before my own sort of personal you know, few years of of of, of challenge and test happened, um, which was from Corinthians, where it talks about I think it's two Corinthians, where it says that God is the God of all comfort, and He comforts us in all our troubles. You know, so it doesn't matter what trouble someone who's listening to this is experiencing. God is there, and it doesn't feel like He is sometimes. He can feel a million miles away, but He comforts us in all our troubles, in order that we can comfort others in all kinds of troubles. And one of the things I found was that unfortunately some Christians weren't that helpful when I was, when I was at my low points, um, they didn't seem to know what to say. They had twee things to say. They had unhelpful things to say, or they just had nothing to say. And so they ran a mile, but some Christians were there for me. And often it was the ones that had been through some kind of major difficulty, not necessarily sickness and other things that I was facing. Um, but, but actually might've been something different, you know, some other, major challenge that they'd been through and um had, had had met god and found god in the midst of it um and and they weren't judgmental they didn't say to me oh you're you're handling this the wrong way adrian you should be more mature or something like that they just sat with me you know um and listened to my my complaints sometimes uh and maybe prayed with me or maybe just showed me some love and some acceptance and and i think you know those are often the real wonderful pastors that we should be um promoting if you like and and looking to people who who've been through something 
have been touched by the fire, as it were, and, and yet God has, has met them in the midst of that, that difficulty. I think that's exactly right. And again, like you, I'm conscious there are many pastors out there who are struggling. I'd want to encourage them to speak to somebody. I think pastoral mm. ministry can often be very lonely. Um, it's so important to have people that you can speak to, whether in the church or outside of the church, that you can be honest with, that you trust, that love you. Um, ideally, that's with your elders and your leadership team, but it might be those externally. I've benefited hugely from lifetime friendships, um, a minister's fraternal group that I meet with regularly, people to be able to turn to and talk about honestly what is going on, who will help you. Um, uh, and we shouldn't be ashamed, to be honest. I think, actually, if we're struggling and are not honest, that's actually when the problems get worse and worse and they then often blow up. Pastors often fall because they knew something was wrong, but they didn't do anything about it early enough to um, address address that issue. From the perspective of congregations and leaders working with pastors and others, um, we need to really care for our leaders. Um, I do I do think that um, uh, the majority of leaders are under significant pressure. Most pastors are not lazy people. Um, I think overwork is far more of a problem than underwork. I think most pastors feel inadequate about the results and the fruit of their ministry. They have deep questions as to why they haven't been more fruitful, why they haven't seen more conversions, why they haven't seen more growth, and they carry that burden um, uh, sort of with them. I think encouragement is hugely needed um, uh, for uh, leaders. Um, uh, the, the proper taking of time for family, for holiday, for personal refreshment. I'm constantly shocked by leaders who don't have a personal devotional life of their own. That, that that may well be their own failing. Sometimes it's because of all the expectations on them of what they are um, to do, that they are not given the space to develop personally and spiritually, and therefore they end up being um, uh, sort of burnt out. Uh, and yes, I think you're right about how we, we care for people. And, and, and I think one of our failings in evangelicalism is we are quick to speak thinking we can solve problems. Um, and sometimes it is just being with people and drawing alongside them. I'm very struck by Christopher Ashe has written a fantastic commentary on Job. And he makes the, the point that at the beginning of the book of Job, the friends just come and sit with Job for days. And I think there is a, a benefit in just being with people and showing that you um, are with them and alongside them. Actually, it all goes wrong in Job when they start speaking, yes. they try, start trying to um, solve his problem and tell him what he's done wrong and why he's in that situation. It was fine while they were silent. Yes. Um, I, I, but I do think that pastors and even individual congregation members, we feel this burden to say something that will solve everything. Whereas very often it's a much more long term process of just being alongside someone and showing them that committed, steadfast love. Yes. I mean, I think that's right, because sometimes, you know, whether that's a, a pastor, a leader or just an ordinary member of the congregation, you can feel like you're an unsolvable problem. And and that might be the case, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that, that God can't can't walk with you. And in this world, Jesus said, we will have troubles. He didn't promise us not to have troubles, but he did say, take heart, I've overcome the world. And he also said that he'd be with us always, um, even at those times when he doesn't feel like it. And that's one of the mysteries of the Christian walk, isn't it? That sometimes uh, you're, when you're at your lowest, yes, sometimes God is very present and very sweet, but sometimes he feels very distant as well. And and that can be very, very difficult when you sort of feel like, this is the time I need you, God, where are you? Uh, and I think to have people that have been through that come alongside you and just encourage you to keep going, to hang on. Sometimes it can feel like you're just hanging on by your fingertips and maybe there's some people mm -hmm. listening to this now um and 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 I, and I guess god just wants you to know that that other people have been there i mean some of the psalms are great for this aren't they yeah and i, I think in, in ministry terms i've planted and led two churches one in a city center with a young student congregation one in a market town with a much older congregation and it's been a real learning experience for me in both of those different contexts when i was leading the student church um i think lots of people had um pastoral issues, but they were relatively fixable pastoral issues that were short term. So should I take this job? Should I go out with this person? Should I get married? Should I live here? And I think it was easy to think that we were solving people's pastoral problems, that that was normal ministry. But in reality, it was both relatively small issues in the context of life as a whole and mm. things that were relatively solvable. And I think in a high turnover, 
city centre ministry, that is what you're dealing with much of the time. Um, in my different context, where you don't have that same turnover, I think we're dealing with a, a, a much larger number of people who are suffering with chronic issues um, in their lives. So it might be ill, Ill health, mental health issues, um, the challenge of, of, of autism or autistic children, um, life circumstances um, uh, uh, that are simply not going to change. Uh, 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 and again, those are not issues that are quickly resolved and that there's a simple answer to. And, you know, in a few months or a, or a year's time, the, the person is going to have dealt with that. But what people need is just long term care and support to keep enduring with Christ, looking ahead to the eternal glory that's to come. And that has certainly changed my perspective on what pastoral ministry is often like. I think um, sometimes we can think of pastoral ministry. It is the a sort of emergency problem solving. Um, very often it's actually the chronic care over, over the long term. And I think one of the things that perhaps um, we're learning after an era in which the emphasis has been on pioneering, entrepreneurial, growing kind of leaders is to mm. rediscover something of what it truly means to be a pastor and a shepherd to people for the long term um, through all the seasons of life um, it, 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 in which many of the issues that they face are chronic and are going to need to be lived with and lived through rather than overcome. That's beautiful. So, John, we've been talking for a while now. Um, and uh, one of the things that I lack because of my health issues is stamina. So I, I'm, I'm kind of running out of steam here, but you seem to be keeping on going. I get the feeling we could talk for another you know, hour, but I wonder if we could perhaps leave it there. But I wondered if you might feel like praying for those yeah. who've been listening. Heavenly Father, thank you for this conversation that we've had. And we do want to lift up to you, particularly those who are in ministry who are struggling right at this time, whether struggling with sin, whether struggling with a feeling of inadequacy, whether struggling with overwork, whether burdened by the pastoral situations that they face. Lord, we would long and pray that you would draw close to them and they would find comfort in you, that they would know that you are the great high priest who loves them, um, who empathises with them and who is able to provide them with grace and help. Uh, in this time of need. Father, we commit to you our country as well, particularly with a new government uh, as uh, Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister. We ask and pray that you would grant him uh, wisdom to know how to govern, to how to face the many challenges um, uh, that we uh, face as a nation. Please, uh, would he uh, continue to want to be a servant? Um, and we pray that that would be reflected um, uh, across uh, his government and across his ministers. We thank you um, for the many uh, freedoms and privileges that we enjoy. Um, uh, we ask and pray that we might continue to be thankful for good government where we experience it. Uh, and we want to thank you for unity in the gospel. Thank you for all the ways um, that you are growing um, your church. Thank you for the faithfulness of previous generations and um, those who've stood firm for the gospel, um, those who've discovered new biblical insights. Um, Father, we want to um, ask and pr pray that you would continue to uh, raise up those who would help us to see more clearly um, uh, ways in which we're perhaps not reflecting what you teach in your word, that we might become more faithful unto um, you. Above all else, we long and pray for the growth of the gospel, for local churches across the country to be faithfully proclaiming Christ and seeing people come to um, uh, sort of new life in him. Uh, we long and pray that you'd be raising up uh, new church planters to be able to take the gospel um, into places where there is uh, no gospel witness or little gospel witness at present. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Adrian. It's been